Disclaimer, the hosts of this podcast, Timothy Patrick and Will Foley, are by no means medical professionals. However, having lived experience with mental illness themselves, they have gained useful perspectives on common mental health issues that some of us struggle to overcome on a daily basis. By sharing their stories, they hope to create connection. By creating connection, they hope to help you find your purpose. And through purpose, we can all begin to build the foundation for positive mental health. This is Above Ground Podcast. Are you ready to lace up your boots, throw up your horns, and jump into the pit? Then let's stomp the stigmas of mental illness. It's time for Above Ground Podcast. Now, Will Foley and Timothy Patrick. What is up, everyone? Welcome to episode 96 of above ground podcast above ground podcast because you can't serve below hey thanks for joining us again we got a good one this week we are joined by our very special guest hannah stainer uh from the uk man she's awesome uh she is the host and producer of the Psyche Mental Well-Being podcast. And speaking of her podcast, the Psyche Mental Well-Being podcast, uh, I was a guest on that podcast recently, and that episode will also be coming out this week as her episode drops on ours. So, and, and it just happened to cross that way. It wasn't planned that way. It just happened to work out that way. And it worked out very well that way. So can't complain. And it was very cool to be a guest on her podcast again, like I said. So I thank her so much. You can check that out everywhere you can check out Above Ground Podcast. You know what else you can check out, though? It's t-shirt weather. Come on, friends. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about supporting your favorite stigma stomping people, man. I'm talking about supporting some Above Ground Podcast. That's right. The only way... To really support the podcast at this at this point in time right now is to either donate through our PayPal donation spot, which we appreciate the donations that we've received. We've received roughly about two hundred dollars worth of donations, man. So that that's pretty cool, and we appreciate that so much. And it's just being used to further our reach. That's what we're doing. Um, but you can also support Close Knit Company. That's right, CloseKnitCo.com. Go to their Collabex. Dan and Natalie still kicking ass, already printing up stuff for Halloween. I saw something Freddy Krueger come across their stream the other day. It was pretty cool. Pretty cool. So don't forget to go to their site, buy an Above Ground Podcast t-shirt. It says, be well, be safe, be above on the back of it. Support. Support. So without further ado, episode 96 Hannah Stainer. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast. Because you can't serve below. Yes, you know who that is. That's your friendly voice <laughs> from another brother. DPP, <laughs> are you down with DPP? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know me. Ah, uh, there's Timmy. 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 How are you doing this morning, Will? I am a great portfolio. I'm doing all right, thank you. How are you? I I'm feel, doing all right. I'm feeling a little Beavis and Butthead today. So. All right. Well, it's still early. Yet. You got a full day ahead of you, pal. Yeah, that's all right, man. You can fill yourself with a lot of Beavis and Butthead in that day. <laughs> hey, are we I'm on Zoom? To... Yeah, we are, man. We are, so we're here for another interview, and we have a fun guest with us this this morning, this afternoon, her time. Um, she is the creator of the Psych E Mental Wellbeing Podcast. Uh, you can find it on Apple. It's a great podcast, and um, I was fortunate enough to be a guest recently on an episode that she'll, have, she'll be releasing in March, um, depending on when this is coming out for us, and uh, she is... So awesome to talk to, and I love the accent. So it's it's great just to hear the <laughs> in conversation, um, and you know, it's awesome to have Hannah Stainer on with us from the Psyche Mental Wellbeing Podcast. How are you? 
Hi, I'm good, thanks. And I feel a little bit of pressure to be fun and exciting, but I can definitely deliver on the accent. That just comes naturally. So, <laughs> well, see, there you go. So you've already won. You've won the battle with me. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for uh, joining us. We're very uh, grateful to have yeah, you. Thank, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to speak with you both, and will to speak with you again. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's great, and I'm and I appreciate so much talking to you the first time. It was great. I wish we could have talked a little a more you know and there's so much more to just you can't only glance over certain things so that kind of gets us to where i wanted to start um you've been podcasting a long time you've got a lot of episodes and i've listened to a lot of your episodes and tim has and uh, they're ma- they're great episodes i want to know why what started you on the journey to record the human condition in the way that you record it yeah so I I guess when I started it was and I I don't know if this was the same when you started your podcast but it was one of these things I did it and I kind of whispered about it I've got a podcast um and I was moving into coaching and supporting people with their mental health and well-being and I love listening to podcasts and I was working with a business coach and I was like oh I'd love to have a podcast but I can't do that she was like why not (laughs) I was like that's a great great question um, and so that's how it started. And it really was a way of, um, one, putting myself out there a little bit in a way that felt comfortable so people could get to know me and then possibly want to work with me. But actually, I've not really used it that much in that way because I just love meeting people and having conversations. And mental health is something that personally I've had experience with that I'm really passionate about talking about and having honest conversations. And now it's something I've made great connections with people. I get to um, sometimes be a bit selfish in asking people questions that help me, which is always great. And it's been a real personal development thing as well as a lot of fun. Um, but in terms of a topic, I think mental health is something that I will happily talk about all day, every day. So obviously that was the, the kind of the topic that naturally um, I wanted to talk about. Yeah, it's excellent. Totally- it totally shows too. Um, you're, it, it, I, I'm, I'm not surprised by your passion for it because you can clearly tell. Um, and it's unique. I love your style also. And how long now? When did you start the podcast? Uh, September 2019. Okay, so we've been around just about the same amount of time. We started in June of 2019, huh? and we're getting close to 100 episodes. Probably I don't know when. Yeah. Maybe April. We're, May, get, we're getting we're getting close to like a hundred listeners, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We like to joke about how many listeners we have. Cause I because I'm sure you fielded some strange emails. In I yeah, I've started getting a lot more of people pitching and sometimes it's it's fine. It's like, yeah, that's appropriate. And then I have one and it was like, I could talk about uh, cryptocurrency investments. Like, Do you know what my show is about? Because <laughs> it's <laughs> not it. Um, but um, actually, it's really interesting because I think a lot of people in the podcasting space, the 100 episodes is like this magical milestone. I don't really know why, but it is. And and since I've crossed that, I have noticed I'm getting more emails and like someone wanted to send me a book the other day, which I've not responded to, but that was quite exciting. I was like, oh, have I made it now? That's cool. <laughs> yeah. um, That's, that is cool. Yeah. Maybe That's we'll get awesome some emails. milestone, man. Maybe we'll get some emails, Will, finally. <laughs> After a hundred episodes. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe that's the magic threshold and we're getting close to that. So yeah. I'm going to hold you to that, Hannah. <laughs> I think it's something about because there's so many podcasts that then just kind of trickle out and I think it's if you've got a body of work essentially and you're consistently putting stuff out there then I guess maybe you're like a reliable safe bet in some way that they're going to spend time interacting with you so I have noticed a difference but um, it's interesting we've been going a similar length of time and I switched last year to two episodes a week and really that's because I'd recorded so many interviews and when I scheduled them all some were like a year and a half in the future. And I thought people are not going to be happy with that. So I went to um, to twice weekly. So yeah. have you noticed a bump because of it? Um, I'm not sure if because of it, I find sometimes there'll be some episodes that might be fewer listeners. And I think sometimes then people get behind and then trying to catch up. Um, but I think we've seen kind of steady, but slow growth. I think it's, it's such an important topic, but it's not really 
like a sexy topic, like some things are like entertainment. And so, and I think there are some big kind of mental health podcasts or kind of well-being, but they tend to have a famous face maybe or a big team. And I'm like a one man show. Uh, I do the whole thing. And so actually for me, that it's nice to have listeners. It's nice to to be reaching more people, but even if just one person get something from it then to me that's that's worth it and it really is like a passion project so I look at the numbers but I'm not that fussed by them that's awesome I think I I, we've had these exact conversations in fact I think I've said that exact same thing to um, a buddy of mine the other day we were talking about the podcast and you know and, and he was genuinely coming from a good place to to you know, have some constructive criticism, maybe get more viewers and stuff. And I said, you know, the truth is, I said, this is, this is it. This is Will and I, we, this is our time. This is our funding, you know, and, and half the time we don't even really know what we're doing. We're just doing it because, you know, we love it. And, and I think just getting it out there is part of what we do is just getting the message across, getting the conversation started. And if, you know, again, if we can reach one person and, and one person says, hey, you know what? And we provoke that one person to think about things a different way or just to think about this in general, then then that's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What um you you had mentioned um getting into the this podcast and mental health. Um can you would you mind, do you feel comfortable talking a little bit about your own journey? Yeah, I talk about it all the time on my show, so it's completely fine. I'm um, pretty much a, um, not a hundred percent open book, but, but pretty open about it. And um, and I, I kind of talk about um, my journey over the last couple of years, um, which was like a point of realization because I had honestly been depressed and anxious probably from my late teens, and I'd known through my twenties I had some periods of depression, which were, were quite obviously depression. And I thought the rest of the time I was fine, I was okay. Um, and it was, I think it was in the right cliche, run up to my thirties, and I kind of looked back over the last decade and went, "Oh crap, I was depressed the whole time." And I thought it was okay, it wasn't really okay. And I decided I didn't want like the next ten years to be like that and that I really wanted to do something about it and in that period I'd a few times gone on antidepressants thing got things got a bit better I stopped taking them and then I didn't really deal with um for me I, I basically hated myself I wasn't happy with myself I was not kind to myself at all and until I you know I could have these lifts where the antidepressants kicked in I had a bit more energy I could do more things but then those kind of demons I guess or those thoughts and feelings about myself would come back up and I wouldn't really have dealt with the underlying thing so um yeah in the run up to my 30s I was like right I'm gonna do something different and I (laughs) did the classic I'd done this before but it kind of stuck this time google like what's good for depression (laughs) and I had a look at the things and you know exercise comes up nutrition sleep those kind of things and I was just like oh so boring exercise like whatever but I was like fine I'll try it I'll just I'll give it a go and I'll see what happens and guess what happened <laughs> it it really did um help and I think it's something that you have to kind of find the thing that works for you and I very much believe there's not like a one size fits all but for me actually getting my body moving and finding something that worked really helped and then doing a lot of a lot of work really on how I f- felt about myself and for me it's one, it was really self-awareness is a thing I talk about a lot that I didn't really know myself. I've been so worried about what people think. I completely had like lost track of my own thoughts and beliefs about things and that it mattered what I thought and, and my opinion that that had some value. So I had to learn to um, listen to myself again, get to know myself again. And that was a really big thing. And then learn to initially just like or tolerate myself before that learning to love myself because that can be like a big jump if you're like I literally hate myself to love yourself which is what lots of people talk about that's like miles away so just being okay with myself and then being able to kind of move forward so now I'm in a pretty good place for myself I think the first time I can remember that I've not been depressed and I still have days where I feel a bit naff but um mostly I'm okay with myself and I'm sort of working on that so yeah that's me (laughs) You know, it's funny. I, I, I hear, I hear that often 
with with the in in the early part of your story when you said with the being depressed and you're like oh i thought i was fine like i've heard that quite a bit from people that we have spoken with it's interesting yeah i think we all go through some part of that because i know i do there's a certain baseline that's a lot lower for certain people that doesn't look like anything other than their normal you know daily personality so it's hard to tell sometimes what is really what yeah i think there might be even some like um you know like i i can handle this kind of thing too going on like ah it's not it's not that bad because you don't you don't you're not really you know you're not really staring at the face to see what it is so you're just like ah whatever ah i got this kind of thing oh yeah sorry i was just gonna say it's funny that i um there's something i've just today (laughs) spoken about for, for my show that i did that I was pretty flat and consistent when I was depressed, but kind of down there, like numb. And so now I feel pretty level and stable, but it's higher up. So I'm not kind of all over the place on the roller coaster. It's still pretty flat line, but it's a different, it's a different place. And it's got a different kind of, I don't know, color or energy to it. I like that. That's a, that, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, that is cool. Makes a lot of sense too. Would you do you now you talk about like uh, self-awareness. Do you think that there's uh, also some accountability to that? Yeah. Um, And this is something I I talk about it is like I'm walking this line between um, the being kind to myself and being able to recognize on the days where actually things are really tough and I need to cut myself some slack, really. And the days where actually I'm just using it as an excuse and I'm being a bit lazy and thinking oh I don't really feel like doing that and I need to push myself a little bit and that although that can be difficult that's still that kind of you know kindness and absolutely taking that accountability of I can control how I feel about myself even though sometimes it feels like I can't but I can be doing things that help me and that work on it and I think for a long time it either felt like too much effort or I didn't know it was possible and actually I now I can see patterns where I'm maybe not being so kind to myself and I'm falling back into patterns. And then I have to hold myself responsible for that and think, well, what there actually are things I can be doing to, to help me. And um, sometimes I choose not to do those things, but most of the time I am. Yeah. That's great to do them. That's great. I, I fully, I fully agree with that 100%. I have to ask this and I don't, I don't want to sound trite by this, by any means, but what was, what was your rock bottom for your self-worth? Like, like what finally led to that? What was that? Like one, was there one thing or was it just a succession of things that said, okay, I really have to look at the Mm -hmm. self-love thing. Cause we talk about self-love a lot because I'm a self-loather myself. So. (laughs) um that's a really good question I am I'm not sure if there's one um particular thing but about that time so there are so I'm the kind of person I um I like to be busy and I and I love my work and even though sometimes I maybe don't like a particular job I love working because if I'm alone with myself sometimes or when I was depressed that was the worst place to be and I was uh, working somewhere where on the one hand, I loved what I was doing. I was teaching, I was working with young people with a lot of mental health stuff. I was being bullied by my boss. And so it was a really low point in that and, and not being able to speak up for myself. And I had, that's the first time I've had days where I was like, I can't actually be there because of how difficult it is. And I had one day I went in and I just was walking into work because I, like, I can't be here. I cried at my desk for a little bit had some coffee, set some work, and then went to the beach because I just needed to, it's like an hour and a half drive to the beach, but I had to just stand in the water and like ground myself. And, um, and after that, I then um, made plans to take a sabbatical, go traveling with my friend. This is probably not immediately after that, but within that window of time. And then I put in a grievance against my manager because I was like, someone's got to stand up. This isn't right. And that using my voice and finding it was a really new thing for me. Um, and I had that kind of like moral indignation like this isn't right but putting my myself out there felt like something really new actually and a really powerful experience even though ultimately nothing happened about it in the workplace for me I guess it was that feeling so um, I don't know that I was 
I guess almost like lying down and letting it happen. I wasn't doing anything about it, even though I knew it was wrong and I knew it wasn't fair. And then having that belief to to actually stand up for myself and to survive it and be able to kind of handle the pushback. I think that was a really powerful experience. That's awesome. Very well yeah. said. And we actually, this <laughs> came up, this came up yesterday, actually, and it'd be, it'd be interesting to pose it to you without any preconceived thought of it is that so conversation we talk a lot about having real conversations here on this podcast and you clearly like to have real conversations on your podcast i want to know is there a specific set of guidelines thoughts ideas loose rule to say what should be in that type of real conversation when you're trying to check in and not really seem like you're checking in, just kind of like just starting the conversation. Cause we talk about it all the time, but we never really clarified what is having that conversation. Is it saying, how are you? And is that a good starter or is there something else that we're missing? Like, what is your thoughts on conversation and, and how to start them? Yeah. I, I don't know that I have a, a specific starting point. I think it's it's thinking about how I am in that space. So I think it's really easy to be kind of stuck in your head <laughs> with everything that you're thinking about and worrying about. And I try to be really present and with the person I'm talking to. And, and it really helps, particularly on my show, that I'm really curious about the people that come on. So naturally, that's already there. I'm not having to, to put that on. But I try and just not overthink and I guess kind of lead from the heart rather than the head. Uh, or something like that and just be in it and respond to what people are saying and shush my own mind (laughs) and um and I when kind of seeing how people are I do ask how they are and there's something um in the UK they there's a campaign for time to change which is all about having open conversations about mental health and they have this really simple but amazing campaign called ask twice so you have the classic like how are you and people say oh I'm fine and you can sometimes tell they are not fine, uh, whether it's they're angry with you and you can tell they're like, I'm fine, um, or that they're upset about something. And so just kind of asking a second time, are you sure? Like, are you okay? Um, so I think that's really powerful. And I think sometimes it's being, to get into that real conversation, it's being willing to open yourself up a little bit first and to kind of offer some kind of vulnerability and sharing something of yourself first because then the other person feels maybe safer to to do the same. Um, So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of how I try and approach conversations. No, I like it. I didn't, you know, it's a question that like came up yesterday in conversation between Tim and I, and I was like, huh, that'd be an interesting question to pose just because we're all conversationalists. And this is a lot of language. And language is very powerful. There's a big difference between putting certain words together that mean this and then changing them around to mean something completely different, but yet the same thing. So it's like interesting to hear where conversation actually stems from for people to, are you, so you're just naturally curious and that's not something that you can necessarily manufacture like that natural curiosity. How do you keep it up? Has it just yeah. always been I, there? Do you find it ebbs and flows with your depression or your anxiety? Because I've listened to your solo episode. I listened to a solo episode of yours where you talked about your own anxiety. And I'm curious to see how that's all handled, like how you're doing with all that and how that all plays in. What's the name of that episode, actually? I, I have not heard that one yet. I think it came out in December of yours. Oh, it's a, I'll, I'll yeah, find um, it. Was that, I was talking about... Yeah, possibly um, depression, self-stigma. And yeah, the funny side of it is when I'm not depressed, suddenly I can feel the anxiety and that's a whole new fun experience because it's like, what's this thing that I was numb to before and now it's here, Um, which in a way is positive, but also a little, you know. Um, But yeah, um, I've always, I feel like when I was younger, I was quite socially anxious and shy. So I always kind of like watch as like a people watcher to try and understand how people operate and interact. And I love psychology and um, and love learning. And I'm always like studying and, and trying to learn and, and that kind of thing. But I recently looked at my, my core values again and curiosity is definitely one of them. So I think it's 
um maybe it's just part of who I am or the way I approach the world I try and understand where people are coming from first and maybe it's because I've always felt like a bit of an outsider and a bit different so that kind of sense of feeling different and then appreciating that other people are all different that everyone else is different to me and I want to try and understand them and who they are and where they're coming from and how they see things because maybe it's different to how I see things and I think I probably do it more (laughs) when I'm anxious because Mm -hmm. I get into being a bit like hyper vigilant and watching people and overanalyzing so actually it probably goes to an extreme and then when I'm if I'm depressed I probably withdraw socially so do it less so when I can be in a kind of healthy curious state that's probably when I'm in a good I like it I like it a lot it's awesome yeah I like it too I I think Will and I both have um when we have had these conversations a lot of what you said comes up so it's it's quite refreshing to hear actually because you know we've always said that if if you can sit and listen and come at it wholeheartedly like I don't I don't think you can do it wrong You know, I think if you have good intentions and, you know, you start by listening, I I don't think, um, I don't think you can really go wrong. Yeah. So I think if you're, even if you say the wrong thing, um, air quotes, wrong thing, (laughs) um, if you've, if you've shown up with that intention of wanting to understand, I think people are much more forgiving of those stumbles because you haven't gone in to judge or make assumptions or anything. And it might be you just kind of trip over your words or something comes out. But I think, if, yeah, if your heart's in the right place and the intention is to be there and to understand, then I think it just just helps. And I sometimes listen back and go, oh, that was maybe not the right thing to say in that moment or problematic in some way. And then I'm very, um, I don't cut those out. I tend to, you know, just comment on it at the end of the episode. I always said that thing and actually reflecting on it, maybe this is what I meant or maybe this is why it was problematic because I think that is um, kind of owning up to your mistakes and kind of modeling how you can learn from them, I think is a really powerful thing to put out there. So I try and do that and let go of what people might think about me, which is uh, an ongoing thing <laughs> that I'm working on. So Perfect. That's, I think it's very powerful yeah. to do that. <clears throat> In fact, one of my, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to say this verbatim, but um, do the best you can until you know better and then when you know better you do better and i think that's a perfect example of it you know because you're not you're not doing it intentionally and and when you saw it yourself you were like oh hold on a minute this could have been handled a a, a bit different and then you learn and then next time we try to do it better we are human humanity sucks sometimes (laughs) (laughs) yep does (laughs) It does sometimes <laughs> sometimes it does that's just being real about it though it's just that's you know, right you can't like that's the that's the harsh part about this like when it like like is there a cut off to empathy at some point where you just have to be like like because i i will say this um it's very hard like i have a mentally ill parent who takes a lot of energy and has taken a lot of energy and you know, it's hard to separate yourself from the one who is affected by stuff and then has to make decisions and then has to sort of, it's easier to be empathetic to strangers sometimes than it is to your family. You know what I'm saying? Because because there's so much tied into that. And is there an empathy cutoff for strangers at some point where you just know that there's the conversation just cannot be had anymore? That's a good question. Um, I guess my, my, my personal kind of thing with the curiosity is that, and, and I did, I studied philosophy for a while as well. So that idea of like, are we born good? And then we kind of, you know, maybe become less good through life or can anyone be born evil? And and that's a deep conversation to, to kind of think about, but I kind of think that maybe things happen through life. Um, and that even if someone is, you know, the kind of the worst side of humanity, that maybe there is something through their life that has contributed to who they are and and how they are. And it might be that you can never really understand that or appreciate it or even support them or change how they are. Um, But I think it's that trying to be empathetic and maybe there is a line of what you can 
handle and what you can cope with and being able to recognize that for yourself that actually I might be as empathetic to you and accept that you are kind of how you are but I personally cannot be around it because I need to look after myself and keep myself safe and so I think that's um probably the line that I would draw because that we we often I think we don't want to talk about that kind of shadow side of ourselves the dark side of ourselves and we don't want to admit that we sometimes have these really dark thoughts or feelings and potentially that maybe if things in our life had panned out a certain way maybe we would be like that as well we don't want to admit that to ourselves um but yeah I do think we have it's... do we have a youngie in our hands well <laughs> it sounds that I, way i heard shadow yeah a lot of shadow <laughs> stuff in there yeah do you know what and... i i really like young um and my therapist is a youngie and alice when i was like picking a therapist it was, she's a youngie and i was like i'll go with you that'll be fun um but uh yeah i so i i think it's that that line is about for yourself what you can handle and I think for some things and it might be the for want of a better phrase you've had like a sheltered like life you've had like a nice life and maybe you haven't glimpsed that much of the shadow so maybe your tolerance is a lot lower whereas people who have been through challenges maybe they can appreciate a little bit more what might have led someone to something so maybe their tolerance is a bit higher but it's about what can I deal with and keep myself safe perfectly said that was that was amazing awesome yeah, it's it's amazing what you can find the tolerance for in in the in the hope of doing something for somebody most mm-hmm. of the time i mean there's probably cutoffs to that for anybody that, you know what i mean that's the i think that's the important thing is what she said is yeah i really you think have you have to the be cost. mindful you have yeah. to know yourself and 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 it's it probably tough especially if you are that you know, people pleaser and you want to help, you have mm-hmm. to say, look it, this is for my own, you know, mental health. This is for my mental wellness. If, if I take a break, I need to recharge and I can come back to this. But mm-hmm. as if I continue right now, I'm not going to be any help. It's like yeah. putting it, it, in the, in the event of emergency, it's on an airplane, you know, you, the mask falls, they say to put it on yourself first. You can't put it on anybody else because then you're no good to, to anybody. I think there's also a distinction between I can try and show empathy and compassion towards you doesn't mean I accept or agree with what you have done and the choices that you've made and separating those things that um, you're not kind of excusing behavior. Maybe you're just trying to show compassion and that can be a difficult thing, that distinction, because we might think, well, if I help them, it means that I'm showing them that I'm, that I'm happy or okay with what they've done. And that's not necessarily the case. I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, just the interaction, you know, most of the things that I see are, it's, there's a lot, it's, it's interpersonal, you know? So if, you know, for Will to, to hear him say, you know, if he's having, you know, a question with empathy and, and if he's down, like I almost, I'm almost like, okay, well, where's this going? Because he's, he is the ambassador of hope. You know, he has that empathy and whether or not I agree with it sometimes or understand it, I do try to sit down and go, what angle is he coming at? And sometimes I learn from it, you know? So in that, in that certain situations where there's circumstances of, of other individuals, it's like, it's almost like we, we can gain strength from others through that. And I think nowadays it's more important to show a diversity amongst teammates because you get, you can't have the same views about everything. It just doesn't make for, it doesn't make for good conversation for one thing, but it also doesn't really make for any, like anything other than an echo chamber of some certain thing. You know what I mean? Now there's granted, there's probably a lot more things that we agree on, then don't agree on but there are things that we don't agree on for sure so it's like and sometimes we get to those sometimes we don't it just depends on how the conversation goes sometimes they just don't lend to that kind of pushing back and forth because it just doesn't get anything accomplished Mm. the idea is just to try to take something away from that and and just try to pass on some sort of knowledge or whatever but what do you i mean do you all like i've had this question come up for myself because um i get a lot of people that will reach out to me and say hey i have this friend who could really use somebody to talk to would you mind talking to them 
and I've talked to a lot of different people and do you, I like, I find sometimes that you try to share yourself in vulnerability, but you get to oversharing sometimes. Like, do you notice the cutoff in you? Do you, do you have that governor set fairly well for you now with all your interview knowledge and, and time that you've, you've gained and wisdom? Like, do you have that set for yourself where you can dial yourself back in that conversation enough? Yeah, I feel like this is something I'm probably it still slips sometimes. I edited an, an interview the other, the other day. I was like, I spoke so much in that one and shared so yeah. much. Um, but particularly, I think particularly in the the kind of coaching and the volunteering and mentoring and stuff that I do, I see it as like little dials. So there's a dial for how much empathy I can show because sometimes in some situations, too much of that is maybe counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve in in that particular thing. So for example, coaching, if I'm constantly going, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, or that's really difficult, that's maybe not helpful for where we're trying to get to, where if I kind of hold that back a little bit, that's more positive. And the amount of myself that I share and my experience is another dial that maybe in mentoring, more of that where it's relevant comes in. But again, in, in kind of coaching or some of the volunteering that I do where it's quite anonymous, if I start going, oh yeah, I know what you mean. And let me tell you about me. Sometimes that does become a kind of self-serving thing or it's an excuse to talk about yourself. And, and I try to be, try to be mindful about what I share and thinking that why am I sharing it? Is it just because I want to talk about me? And to be honest, I can do that on my podcast in the beginning and end thing. If I really want to, you know, go off on one about myself. Um, But in that situation, is it going to be helpful? Is it, Am I focused on that other person and thinking about how this story or this experience might help them in some way? Or am I just sharing it because I want to talk? And I do have um, obviously friends and support around me that I can do that just talking and offloading and processing because I think that's really important as well. And it's thinking maybe in that situation, kind of what's my role in it? Am I here to listen and to support or is it a, a two-way conversation where we're both sharing what's the kind of the, the aim or the focus which I think it makes me sound like I'm really analytical every time I go into a discussion like oh who am I supposed to be but um <laughs> it feels like it's more automatic that I sort of know okay I'm um supporting so it's about you or it's about both of us and then there might be more of me if that makes sense it, I think it does and I, I actually it, it it sounds like you're uh, you look at, you almost kind of, um, you know, like you said, get analytical about the conversation. So look at the conversation as a, as a single entity and, and say, what does this specific conversation need? Or how am I going to approach this conversation? Because that's going to be different from the one before and the one after it. Is that, is that kind of? Yeah. 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 And so in the conversation, so for example, um, I do some volunteering on um, a suicide helpline. Um, and so in that, it's very much, I'm not sharing any of myself because it's about that person. So, so some of my roles and the conversations have a very clear focus. But if it was the, can you talk to this person? Again, it's about that person and talking. And so if I get into sharing lots of myself, that's not really what that conversation is about. Whereas it's a bit more flexible in conversations with friends and it might be if they're really struggling, I might hold back a bit more of my stuff to be able to support them without kind of doing that. I think you should do this. And have you thought about this? And let me try and fix it for you. Let me tell you what to do, which actually can be quite counterproductive. Do you think sometimes it could be helpful, though, at the same time, just if they hear, you know, like maybe, hey, you went through it and you tried this and it worked, you yeah. know? Yeah. And but I think there's a difference to. Um, sharing your experience of oh I had something similar this is what I did this is what worked for me and saying I think you should do this because it's what I did so yeah yeah there's gotcha. a fine there's a fine line in that person-centered therapy type model that you can't cross because then it becomes something else and it's again it's about language it's again it's about how it's said and how it's posed to you and stuff I think a lot I'm sorry go right ahead sorry, I was gonna say I think a lot probably comes from how I like <laughs> to have conversations so if someone just tells me what to do I'm the kind of person I'm like don't tell me what to do and I can be a bit defensive so I think with the self-awareness I know how 
I like to be interacted with. And it might be if I say, oh, what do you think? I'm asking you to give me suggestions. But if someone just tells me what to do, I'm probably more like to not do that just to be stubborn. Um, so I think that really <laughs> informs my approach as well because I know I don't like it. So I don't want to be doing it. I think we all have to be. I think we all have to be at some point that, uh, you know, you got to fuck the system at some point. I mean, you got to work with it too at certain points. There's a, there's a give and take that you have to, and a balance that you have to, to keep, but it's hard to do sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, Anna, I got to you... ask this before oh. I forget. Sorry, Tim. And I, so I, do you have a favorite song? Like, are you into music? Do you have like a, a, a particular favorite song or something that just automatically gives you all the feels or is there anything that you know has had such a monumental shape on your mental health in any way that you know you're like yes that song is so I love music I go through phases with with music I think and I'm uh so I was born at kind of end of the 80s so through the 90s and the 2000s so I was a proper like bit of emo punk rock uh kind of era um, so I do like that kind of emotional music and a bit miserable and uh, to sit in that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but, but <laughs> something and I, I'm not ashamed to admit this, but I'm also a little bit ashamed to admit this because there was an album that had a massive impact on me. And considering that's my kind of preferred genre, it was actually K-pop and there's a K-pop band I really got into. And there was an album and it's all about loving yourself. And that really, that <laughs> message really struck me. So although I've got that kind of rocky, like heavy metal uh, thing, and I also like a lot of like, um, you know, like classic heavy metal. So like I love Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, that kind yes. of stuff. But <laughs> yes. it was this K-pop album that was really a moment of like, oh yeah, maybe I should love myself. <laughs> so. Well, we all have those, we all have those pop moments. I have lots of them. They're sprinkled throughout my youth and yeah. throughout my adulthood. Because there's good pop music now, K-pop. There's a series about, like, things you should know. or I'm not sure which podcast it is, but they were talking about K-pop recently. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of people who formerly were into, like, emo music. They're now really into K-pop, like, my kind of age. So maybe there's uh, there's something in that. Yeah, apparently so, yeah. I would have thought that that would have, you know, filtered into us oldies music, you know, of death metal and, and screamo and, you know yeah the other stuff yeah you hannah you had mentioned um you you volunteer through uh with a suicide hotline Mm -hmm. is there something that like i'm I'm not sure how long you have been doing this but is has there been something um that you have noticed that is that pops up more than say something else like what do you see what do you hear often Hmm. so and i'm being very mindful because it's a confidential line <laughs> so, oh well you, so, yeah yeah, um, yeah you don't have, no, but, i'm not looking for, yeah. for specifics but do you i guess maybe the question i i should have worded it better do you think um are people just wanting to be heard are mm. people um you know just so depressed that they can't really um do much to help themselves yeah in in that aspect yeah, I think quite often it's people who feel a bit desperate, that they feel really low, they feel maybe really lonely or isolated, or they just don't know how to get out of where they are now. They just know they want things to be different and they just are at that point. And so it's, I guess it's almost feels like a, a lifeline or a kind of reaching out. Um, and actually it's very much an... Um, non-directive line so it's very much about sitting with them in that and helping them to explore it and listen and not to try and influence basically what they want to do one way or another just to kind of be with them and listen because I think that's something that that can be missing and I think particularly if you've been feeling low for a while and maybe you've gone over this with family and friends quite a lot that sometimes people can lose that that patience with it if if you're going over the same stuff and you can still be stuck you haven't moved forward you still need support you still need to talk about it and so actually that's where it can be helpful to have someone who will kind of gently question to help you to explore it more and maybe think about your options and kind of what you can can do but I think it really um and there is a whole range 
of types of calls, but I think a lot is about that. I'm desperate and I don't know what to do. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, we talk about that a lot on this show about people in desperation and that a lot of times that it's just you can't save the unsavable. And that's very hard to it's a very hard concept to to wrap your head around because there because there is a point where there's a decision made mm. that there's you know you know that you are either staying or you're not i think and i i don't know and it's but nobody realizes the struggle that you've put up to get to that point oftentimes so a lot of people yeah. still just have this big misconception about and it's hard to talk about. And I think if someone is really desperate, like a, a loved one, and they're talking to you, saying to them, are you feeling suicidal? That for a lot of people, they wouldn't even go there because they don't know how to even broach that subject. They don't know how to deal with it. What if they say yes? What am, what am I supposed to do? How do I respond to it? So they maybe just don't. And that question can be really powerful because it could be that then they actually talk about it and they realize, actually, no, I don't really want to die. I just want things to be different and then have the support. So that question, I think it's it's a hard one to ask, but it can be really powerful. And to e even just to say it out loud, this is how I'm feeling. And someone has recognized that is such a powerful thing, I think. Yeah, I know. Like when we, uh, when Tim and I do peer groups, um, I have a list of of feelings that I have we have that we give handouts and I have a two sided sheet of paper that has a list of positive and a list of negative feelings that we hand out to everybody. So when we start talking about stuff, I ask people just to look at stuff so they can sort of get to that next thing because it's brought up by Tim about, and we get into the secondary emotional stuff, which is really where the meat of everything, you know, and those third, those deep rooted things are the ones that really, are the ones that you're seeing on top, but they're not necessarily what you're seeing. They're just manifested different. Yeah. There's something, I don't know uh, your thoughts around this. And this is kind of maybe my my thoughts. And I think it's it's possible to, to kind of learn, I guess the kind of more theoretical, this is why people might feel suicidal and that kind of thing. But I think there's something, if you have experienced those thoughts and feelings yourself there is a, a greater understanding in a way that you can kind of just get it in a way that's more difficult for other people maybe and I think I um, have definitely had suicidal thoughts and when I first went to the doctors was because I'd be driving home and thinking well what if I just don't <laughs> stop my my car when people are braking and I was like this is not a good place to be and so I've had the thoughts like periodically I've not ever acted on them myself but I've had those thoughts so I can kind of understand that feeling of I just want things to be different. I don't, it's too difficult where things are. I just want it to stop. I just kind of want to get off. And, and I think that having experienced those feelings yourself, I think helps in a way to be able to support other people. I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I would say I would agree with that hundred percent. I, I think we've actually said that before we've talked about it before. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a place that, you know, that may not be talked about. Um, that it's a place that, you know, may be different for, from person to person, but it, if you have been to that place, then there's a certain understanding that someone who has not been to that place will not be able to grasp. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a, there's a difference in knowing what clinically book, you know, book ready answers to typical situations are. Um, it's different to literally ask that question and have somebody say, yeah, and not, and freeze. And I'm lucky that I don't freeze because I, I have enough training and, and, and knowledge to know that most of the time it just takes a matter of probing with a little bit more. Um, but there are times when you can tell that things need to be moved to a different things. And we've had that happen, you know, 
to us, you know what I mean, and, and stuff. But um, I think that there's a difference in people who've been there and touched that darkness that have something slightly different view of it than people who don't or that have a vested interest in in you surviving necessarily even if you're not choosing that so i i, I you know and, and i think that there's a, a value in that and i think that it it makes it a lot easier to have the conversation and that's actually a proven method to ask if that is the question is if, are you thinking of doing that and that's the quickest way to snap somebody out of it because it's most people don't understand to ask just ask that point blank like they everybody wants to nobody wants to be the one to bust up the party man <laughs> you know but it's you know but it's it's no i think you're right will and i even think kind of piggybacking off that like what han had even said earlier it's is it when when someone is asked that question themselves then they if they think about it you know maybe they decide that yeah you know what i really don't it's just more or less like i am in this dark hole i am in so much pain and and hurt that i i don't want to continue in this you know, and some don't know, don't know any better. Like they don't know if there's ways out of it. Or at you least know? realizing that it's mimicking the thought that you're having that. So is it, is it a conscious thing that you know you're doing or is it a subconscious thing? And I think you would be able to get to know that within a couple of questions of just the intent mm -hmm. or the, and the content of it, I think. If it is, you know, as long as you're open to, to hearing the answer, man, because you may get yeah. to a point where they say yes. And you're like, okay, well, okay. How, then you got to, then it goes to another level of seriousness where you have to figure out, is this, you know, yeah. a, a, a 911, is this, you know, is this something different? Is this, you know, so it's, but I it, think it goes, know. I think it go back to what we kind of almost started this conversation with is, is, you know, if someone did come back with a yes, it's, it's that, um, you know, wholeheartedly, like, you know, I don't know if there's a, a certain standard on what to do and what not to, you know, I'm sure there's things not to do, but if you come at it from a good place, you know, I, th I think that it's going to help. Yeah. I think it's, you know, the idea of asking the question is that fear of like the answer, isn't it? Because there's, if it's a yes, what happens then and how am I going to be responsible or involved in some way? What, what do I do in that situation? Um, I think there's also this fear, which hopefully is diminishing, but for some people that it's suddenly it's going to put that idea in someone's head that they maybe it didn't even cross their mind. And suddenly you've said it and they're like, whoa, yeah. Um, but I think also the, like the, the worst case scenario is they might go, no, I'm not like, what are you talking about? I'm not at all. So yeah, I think it's, are you, um, prepared or are you able to like you said kind of wholeheartedly be with that person and, and support them and kind of see what support they want and and you know how they I want to yeah I, w I wish that um you know the, those people that think that way could could go up to other people and be like you know like maybe some some kids and say hey you know uh are you gonna do your homework and then automatically they just go yeah they, it encourage them to do their homework right like hey you're gonna go out <laughs> You're going to go out and shovel snow today? Yeah. Yeah. The driveway's already done. You know, great. Like what kind of, you know, what kind of logic lies in that, you know? And, and that's another thing is, is if, is if we've thought that way for years and, and obviously it, it hasn't been working. So now it's time to maybe uh, start thinking some new ways to, to look at it and to go about it. You mm -hmm. know, I think the, the main reason why I asked the question about you, um, volunteering on the suicide hotline is because it's for you know it was kind of what you had mentioned earlier it's kind of selfish on my part to to get a better understanding on this you know and and if someone listening hears other aspects of it open up their minds and and learn something you know yeah and the and this might be different to helplines elsewhere um and ours is very much um obviously their ultimate aim is for there to be fewer suicides but they are 
an open non-judgmental and non-directive so they believe that everyone has the right to self-determination so they're not going to try and talk you out of anything but it's to they aim to try and help people explore those feelings with the hope that when they've had that space to talk and be listened to that they will come to a different choice for themselves and I think there's something really powerful in that in the I'm not going to try and be like oh no 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 look how great everything is and you know you've got loads to live for and I'm going to try and guilt you into like what would people say if you we're just going to sit and we're going to listen and we're going to explore it and then hopefully you will come to something different for yourself that's a really awesome thing that's a really great is is um is there like a name behind the the line like is there like a um yeah there is it's the samaritans in the in the uk so Ah, that's what it is okay see they're not they're not as readily available here in our part of the state they are in new york city Mm. now but they've the albany it's they're hard to find now because i actually looked at trying to see if they were available now to volunteer at because i would like to do that just to get that experience yeah well is that is that this is that similar to the like the 1-800 the national suicide hotline number no that goes no. to a different office that goes okay to, i don't know if it goes to suicide prevention council or whatever it goes to i forget exactly where it goes to just in case a national hotline that they try to filter i believe you know they talk to you and it's like a crisis mm-hmm. hotline and then they just, filter it through to the proper people if they need to just in case we have um any anyone from uk listening do you have uh what is the not can you read off that number yeah, yeah. so um i believe i'll double check this by <laughs> it's 116132 uh so it's uk and ireland um you might also some parts of europe be able to reach it and there is an email service and i believe a text service so um yeah because some people maybe don't want to phone and they can have that ongoing support but I've not been volunteering with them for that long, but I think they're a fab organization. I really love all their values and and what they're about. And I think it's an amazing service. And I, when I started volunteering, I thought about it before, but I often (laughs) give their telephone number on my podcast and say, Hey, you know, if you need someone to talk to you. And I kind of felt that the decent thing to do would be if I'm going to be potentially sending lots of people to call them, that I should give some of my time as well to (laughs) to be on the phone. But it's, um, a really valuable experience um and and i really enjoy it and i think being able to be there for someone when they're having a really tough time is is really rewarding even if it's you know tough for you to deal with but there is so much support with the way it runs so it's not just like you at home like taking phone calls and having to deal with that it's in the branch there's not just you on there's a real like support system yeah there's a bunch of resources linked to it yeah Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, that sound that sounds like a really awesome thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I will say um I I don't know. I've never had any personal experience at the National Hotline, so I don't know exactly what the protocol is. And it's not like a number I want to call just to ask questions cuz you don't want to take up you know what I mean? It's kind of rude. So I got to look up their AQ and see what their deal is. But um, so we always have, we always end the show with three questions. So we're on this question thing. So we're going to, we're just going to keep the train rolling. Okay. So I'm going to let Timmy, uh, I'm gonna let Timmy ask this question. Hannah, do you have a favorite or least favorite word? Hmm. I don't think I've got any least favorite. Um, I know some people have got words that they really just hate. Um, and I, <laughs> It sounds really horrible, but I've got a friend, she's got a word she hates and I deliberately say it to her. Um, you can say so, that if you'd like. Oh, hers is moist. She hates it. So if there's like a menu with like moist cake, I'm like, look, it's, um, but I don't have, I don't really have the least favorite word. Um, do I have a favorite? I think I go through phases. Uh, at the moment, I feel like awesome. Like everything's awesome or fab. Uh, so fab. A lot. Yeah, I just edited a podcast episode and it was like a, the Lego movie because like everything was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Great, um, now I'm going to be singing that the rest of the day. Thank yes, you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, and I also say a lot, I've got um, a friend who listens to my podcast a lot and he'll kind of message me and I say waffle a lot as in like just like chatting on about stuff. I'll say oh, I'm waffling now. And I think whether that's a British thing or it's just me and, and he was like, what do you mean? And so I'm quite aware that I say that a lot because he'll quite often send me a message just saying, like, waffling with a smiley face. 
so I think I get into into phases, but yeah, awesome fab and waffling are probably my awesome. three at the moment. We're just waffling with Hannah. That's waffling. right. I yeah. like it. <laughs> All right. So dog, cat, or other. Um, I've I've got to say dog. I mean, I do like cats as well, but I've got a pup pup downstairs to sleep on the sofa. So I've got to say dogs. Yeah. Do you find it's great to just be able to get out and get out for a walk and well <laughs> I mean, it would be nice if he was a dog that loved going out walking all the time. But <laughs> if it's if it's raining, he's not going out. If he's too tired, he's not going out. If he just it's too cold, not going out. He's really stubborn and grumpy. He's uh, 11 and a half. He's a rescue. He's a grumpy old man. It's on his terms, basically. He is so much fun. And it was really nice. And this is it's so really positive. I think that he he'd had a really tough, like traumatic time before he came to us. And then with the love and being spoiled a lot, his personality is coming out and now it's like stubborn side and his grumpy side come out, which is really sweet. And it kind of shows that when you have that love and support, it can be really healing. And he's such a character. But yeah, he only has short walks at most because uh, he's got stiff joints and only when he wants them. So. <laughs> wow, he sounds like a typical old man. Wow. He really is. What's his name? Hector. Hector. Yeah, yeah, he's a, a staffy, so he's um, yeah, very cute, um, but grumpy. <laughs> so, kind of like Will. Yeah, pretty much. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much like me. Cute, grumpy. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, do you love to Gr- eat? Grumpy. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, love to he's eat. Constantly you know. food, food obsessed. Eat, drink. So. You know, eat, yeah. drink, do all that stuff. I like all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Life is short, man. Make it shorter. <laughs> I'm going to call you Hector from now on, Will. Nice. Nice. Uh. <laughs> so, Hannah, if there was something that you could do or that you would like to see done for mental health as a whole, what would it be if you had no constraints? Wow. Hmm. Oh, so many things. Um, I, I guess the first thing that came to my mind was more funding. For, for mental health services because I think having access to them and I know your health services are completely different thing to ours but in ours there is some on the health service but the waiting list particularly for child and adolescent mental health services sometimes is so long can be 18 months and actually when you look at sometimes people who've had maybe multiple suicide attempts and they're still on the waiting list because there's not enough services so funding and I I think health is one of those things and mental health that in the UK, I think all the, the main parties are like, it's a serious thing, we should take it seriously. But I think there are some things that when they get too politicized and you know they get funding cut from them or whatever, I, I think that's not a great place to be in. And I don't know whether, you know, there are no constraints, if it could be depoliticized, that so everyone could be like, yeah, this is an important thing. We are gonna fund it because actually to have a healthy population, there are certain things like education and healthcare that should be essential then in an ideal world, I'd have it taken seriously funded and not in that kind of political chewing and throwing and that kind of thing. Um, and can, can I have another thing? Um, <laughs> just, yeah, lot, whatever you want. Lots on my wish list. Uh, I think it's something that we are talking about more now uh, in school and with young people, but I think that more could be done around that of preparing young people for life, for being able to manage how they feel to talk about it and when I was teaching I was and I was teaching teenagers but I was quite open where appropriate about my mental health and I think there's that whole fear and stigma of oh I'm in this role I can't be open about my own struggles even with my employer let alone with the children I'm working with and actually that was a really powerful thing I think to be like yeah this is a little bit of my experience or I find things difficult at times but I am dealing with it and I have a job and that's possible. So I think, I guess it's about opening up that conversation, particularly with children, so that hopefully in a few generations time, we're not having so much pressure on our mental health services because people are better able to deal with some of those things before they get to that point of desperation. So, yeah. Speaking my language, I say the same thing. (laughs) I agree with that 110%. Like that's, that's where it's at for sure. Like education, teaching them, you know, teaching them strategies, skill, life skills, you know, how to deal with emotions, what emotions are. Even. It's like so many people are, are 
are just, you know, it's just not talked about. It's not something that, you know. I think that's something that we can do in the education system. I think also parents can do to be a bit more open and, um, you know, and I don't have children, um, but, you know, if you are annoyed about something, there's a difference between having a go at your kid because you're annoyed at them and, and being able to sort of voice, I'm frustrated about this. This is what I'm going to do about it. And it might seem simple or might maybe it seems difficult, but by being open about it, you are modeling that we have emotions that are okay to feel and that there are things you can do about them. So I think that's you know, any parents listening, that's a really positive thing to, to think about. If you're feeling sad or if your child's feeling sad, not kind of go, no, 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 you're fine. You're happy. It's, you know, allowing them to feel it and supporting them to think, well, what can we do to not, you know, it's not about not feeling it, it's moving through it. And sometimes it's sitting in that sadness for a little bit and thinking about what it is and then thinking now, how can I move back to that kind of consistent calm level? I think we also have to look at mental health like we do physical health as we've talked about this. And I'm sure you probably agree with this, that, you know, you go for your yearly checkup. Why is mental health like a few questions and then, you know, then they send you to something else or they do it. Like, I think we need to like have it as a a year, at least a yearly part of the conversation. Mm. And I think if you start somewhere like that, but is it why, like, is there a great stigma in, in, in the UK also? There must be, especially amongst a lot of the men over there. Right. Cause. Yeah. I think um, it is better than it was. And I think, I mentioned the time to change campaign and that was a big thing about having this conversation. And I think there have also been more uh, public figures, particularly male public figures who have been outspoken. So uh, Prince William and Harry did uh, an episode and they talked about losing their mother and they talked about that. I believe was it Freddie Flintoff, the cricketer did something talking about that. And when you have high profile people who put themselves out there and talk about their mental health, I think that can be really powerful. And, and it seems that there is a growing amount of um, men's support and conversations about men's mental health as well. Um, but I think there is still stigma and there is still a way to go. And I think, you know, media representations of mental health can still be very negative and kind of cliched and, you know, all of that. Um, but this could just be my, <laughs> my judgment but I feel that the UK is maybe in a better place than the US in terms of views of mental health and support. I don't know, but that's kind of my perception of it. So. I will say this. There are some resources that I found online that came from the UK, and I'm not sure exactly which program it came from, but they were booklets about different mental health things, and they were the best booklets I've ever seen. Like, they were just great. And I was yeah. like, wow, I'm like... That was easy to find. I'm like, but yeah. we don't have like, I mean, we, we have great organizations here in the U S that do a lot of good work, but you know, I think sometimes it gets lost in the, in the fundraising part of it. And mm-hmm. I think it gets, and it's not, I have nothing against fundraising, man. It takes money to do everything, but I think sometimes it does get, it gets a little bit, you know, a little bit yeah. off when it comes to, we're stuck on we're stuck on treating the symptoms instead of the people and, and yeah. you know being being reaction reactionary instead of being proactive so yeah. that's that that lies a huge burden on people i think that's a big variable for sure you know instead of getting to the root you know digging out the root cutting out you know the root to figure it out we just kind of trim a branch and wait for another 2 years and if mm. you know if a celebrity or, you know, somebody popular, you know, dies by suicide, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit and publicize it and, and a week we'll forget about it. Mm. Yeah, I think we still have that a bit, but I think our health service, there is a lot of information on their website and it's not just about, well, these are some of the drugs that maybe you can take. They are branching out into some of the things that they offer as treatment. So um, I believe you can get clinical hypnotherapy, uh, you can, there's mindfulness based cognitive therapy. Um, and um, they can also, they can, so this is slightly different, but um, for, for weight loss, they can prescribe certain things for that that are not just, you know, the, I don't know, mainstream. So they're a bit more creative, but the Mind website, so Mind is a charity, but they have the best um, information about 
pretty much any kind of mental health conditions and they have you know the, the kind of symptoms things you can do how to get help they also have a section for friends and family so how you can support someone so we do have a lot of mental health charities actually about specific conditions or generally and there is a lot of great information and um support and and i think there is a growing particularly with coronavirus actually there have been a lot of conversations about mental health and about how even people who maybe haven't struggled before are struggling now and people who had been struggling already that is being kind of compounded so i think there is a growing focus um and a lot of those big charities do a lot of kind of campaigning um to the government of you know trying to get support and and getting um changes to to what's available so it feels like we are making progress but probably not as fast as i'd like or we should make but um yeah progress is good though baby steps right yeah keep at keep keep asking twice yes yeah keep keep waffling with hannah (laughs) yep all right you still didn't answer my question about a favorite song though like you said you were you said you're like a like are we talking like mm-hmm. classic punk music we talking well, you said you're a big black sabbath fan so yeah i, I know like, that i was yeah. gonna go off of that well so i was like right i've got I, I, I can't just give you one um i really like one of my favorite bands is a band called skindred and they're like yeah. uh i don't know if you heard them that from wales and they're like a metal reggae band so they're all yeah. like probably i was supposed to get married last year I was supposed to get married this year who knows what happened and i am <laughs> my stepmom i think i told her this she wasn't pleased with it it's gonna happen i'm gonna walk down the aisle to the immigrant song <laughs> that's my Good plan for you. That's i awesome. don't know that's awesome. i don't know that how the timing is gonna work because it's a pretty fast song but i'm gonna make an entrance with that so um let's go <laughs> that's, that's that an entrance that's an entrance yeah. that's awesome love yeah. it yeah, um, we're also going to play while people are waiting all the kind of like <laughs> kind of anti uh, love songs like I Want to Break Free uh, and Freebird and uh, <laughs> I've got a whole playlist of like <laughs> all those kind of songs. So That's gonna awesome. Be, it's going to be that unorthodox. Is, that yeah. is very classic. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Thank you so much for, um, you know, spending the time with us and, and having a conversation appreciate it yeah you're so welcome i've really enjoyed it so thanks so much for having me yeah thank you so don't forget to check out uh hannah her psyche mental wellness podcast uh it's awesome there's a lot so much so much stuff that you've covered in 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 your seasons man i'm like wow there's a lot of waffling there's (laughs) a lot of waffling a lot of waffling yeah and thank you hannah so much for being here it was so awesome talking to you Um, yeah you're welcome So until uh, next time, be well. Be safe. Be above. above.